The overwhelmed brain is a proud provider of self-empowerment for your personal evolution. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you irritated when someone tells you to think positively? I realize you just got devastating news, but now's the time to swallow that pain and sadness and force a smile so that the world doesn't judge you for having perfectly normal human emotions. Do that, and you'll be happy all the time like me. <laughs> now excuse me while I whistle so loud that everyone in this store will have no choice but to hear what I want them to hear instead of being at peace in the silence of their own thoughts. If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then get ready to start creating the life you've always wanted now. Hello, this is Paul Coliani, host of The Overwhelmed Brain, the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On every episode, we'll talk about practical down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and keep you sane in this powerful journey we call life. I want to help you bridge the gap between your emotions and reason, causing you to discover why you do the things you do and what you can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. Now, if you're here to learn more common sense tips for improving your life, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> this is the direct path to uncommon sense, and that's why it's going to help you learn, heal, grow, and evolve. Now, before we begin, I just want to tell you, if you have written to me in the past two months, you're probably wondering, how come you haven't responded yet? <laughs> or, why aren't you talking about my question on the air? Well, I get a lot of emails, and I appreciate and read every single one of them. And some of them I have to think about because they're pretty deep and they're pretty complex and there's things going on and, uh, that I may not have an immediate answer to or suggestion or opinion or advice or, or whatever. So I have to sit on them for a little while and um, I want to immediately respond to you, but I just can't. But... I do respond to every single one of them in time. I have, I don't know, probably maybe 30 or so unanswered emails in my inbox right now. So to you, I apologize. It is not my intention to make you wait. And so you have to continue dealing with the situation that you're in or, or if you're not sure what to do next and you're just waiting for maybe some extra piece of information that I can give you that might help you have uh, some forward progress in what you're going through. So I apologize to you. I'm sorry I can't answer right away. Uh, that's one of the reasons I came up with the TOB patron program. And one of the options in there is to get uh, immediate replies within at least within 48 hours. I do my best so that you can get faster access to me when you need it. And that's why I put that option. If you're interested in that program, just go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash member and of course, that's one of the levels in the program. You get other incentives with that program, like um, private episodes that you won't hear anywhere else and group coaching and things like that. But the reason I'm mentioning this is because, you know, every episode I have an Ask Paul segment. But uh, because I've been receiving so many emails, I've been stretching these episodes to basically be an entire Ask Paul episode. And uh, I, I think it's helpful because... No matter what, like I used to have the quote of the week or something I used to call quick quote or of the day or something like that. And uh, that would be a subject matter that I would talk about and expand upon and give you my insights or opinions or what I thought about it. And we would just go into the next segment, which is Ask Paul. But um, instead of having the quote, now I'm basically telling you longer quotes, <laughs> which are emails. So I just read these longer quotes and then I give you some of my insights there. But, um, I haven't heard anyone complain going, where's the quotes? I love the quotes. <laughs> so if I, if I ever get um, less email and I need some other segments to fill the show, then I'll definitely put, put that quote back in. But I think the uh, reading the emails on the air and 
basically taking up a whole episode has been working out because uh, what people write in about, what you write in about, is what so many other people are going through. Now, I will say that lately, 98% of the emails that I get are about relationships. Now, not all of us are in relationships. I am in a relationship, and it is possible that at one time, if you're not in one now, you were, or you're going to be, because that's what we do. We get into relationships, sometimes romantic, sometimes platonic, sometimes family, but they're all relationships, and every email that I receive applies to relationships, even when the email is not about relationships. So I'll get letters about, you know, my wife does this or my husband does that, or I am in a situation that I'm not sure if I should stay or go. And, uh, what do you think? And, or here's what happened to me. And I got angry and I said this and I said that, uh, is there a better way to handle it? And I get a lot of those. And sometimes I just get emails like the one I'm about to read you, which is I'm having this issue with me and me alone and I don't know what to do, or I'm having a challenge, and maybe you can give me some input here on what to do to get beyond this challenge or heal through it. But even that type of letter is still a relationship issue because it's a relationship with yourself. What does that mean? It means, how do you relate to yourself? I think the best way to to look at that is to perhaps listen to Eckhart Tolle where he talks about having a uh, conversation with himself when he was at the peak of his depression and he was going through some major breakdown. I think he said it was in his room, maybe during college, and he just had this breakdown and he had this thought. And this thought came to mind and, and and it was something like, I can't stand to be with myself any longer or or I can't stand myself any longer. He said something to that effect. And this other thought came to mind and he goes, wait a minute, who is this I and who is myself? And he experienced a profound shift that altered his perception of I and me and myself. And he suddenly experienced one part of himself talking to another part of himself. And the part of him that was stuck in this deep, dark place was talking to another part of himself that uh, basically he says was free of ego. And it was that moment that he chose to be free of ego and what ego had had done to him or how ego had uh, brought him to this dark place because he was attached to so many things. He was attached to the outcomes. He was attached to the emotions. He was attached to everything. And much of what the ego does for us is keep us attached to things that are sometimes unhealthy to be attached to. And when he reached this precipice of darkness and breakthrough of lightness, where he just kind of separated from that, he reached a new state of being. He reached a new state of mind. And he was suddenly free. And he felt free. He no longer had worries. He no longer felt like he was in a dark place. He just felt free. But he noticed a relationship with himself. He noticed kind of the yin-yang inside of him. Now, these are my words, not his. But when I remember his story and think about how it relates to some of the stuff I teach, I think about how when he reached that point where that separation took place and he let go of whatever he let go, It was sort of the self-centered, high ego state of being attached to all these things, uh, relating to the part of himself that wanted to be free of all of that. And he was able to separate from that darker place and, and nothing really bothered him after that. And if you've read his story, he just kind of sat around for a few years on a park bench feeding the birds. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't know if his parents were taking care of him. I don't know I don't know if he had a house or shelter or anything like that. He just sat in the park, he said, and eventually he wrote a book and then the book was able to provide him money to live and he's just lived a different life since then. 
But the reason I wanted to mention that is because uh, we do have a relationship with ourself. And sometimes that comes out in our inner dialogue, our self-talk, where we talk to ourselves. So, so think about that. <laughs> think about like the last episode, if you heard my Minutes to Momentum episode, I talk about me telling myself, uh, I'm so stupid. Why do they do that? I'm so stupid. And that is a part of me talking to myself. And what is that? What does that mean? Does that mean I have this split personality? <laughs> or is there something else that might be at a higher, deeper, uh, unknown level inside of me? That there really are aspects of my personality communicating with each other. It's probably, I mean, my immediate thought is like, no, I don't have aspects of my personality communicating with each other, but maybe I do. <laughs> Just because I don't believe it doesn't mean it's not true. Like, for example, the unconscious communicating with the conscious mind. That's entirely possible. I mean, I'm thinking about this in real time. It's entirely possible that we could get messages from our unconscious mind that is a part of us that might make help us make a decision or take action. So as I think about it now, I, I kind of do believe that because when I was in hypnosis and I learned how to communicate with the subconscious mind, the people, the clients that I had would make changes and sometimes not even know why they made those changes. So their conscious of their actions and their behavior, but they're making decisions and taking action, doing things with messages from their unconscious mind. Hard to explain, but I think you get it. It's like what motivates us at a deeper level. And I think that's a good way to look at a relationship with yourself is what motivates you at a deeper level is the relationship you have with yourself. It's kind of like when I talk about values. Values are what motivate us at a deeper unconscious level. And that part of ourself drives our behavior, drives our conscious behavior. So this is good to know. This is good to remember because when you talk to yourself, you can literally talk to yourself. You can literally go inside your mind and and when you when you hear this message like for example, like my last episode, I said, I'm so stupid. Okay, what if I talk to myself? Oh, why do you feel so stupid? Well, I feel so stupid because I did this. Well, what's wrong with doing that? And then, then you could do the drill down process that I teach. Well, what about that so bad? Well, I feel bad because I sent people to the, the wrong website. Okay, so they, you sent them to the wrong website. How is that so bad? Well, they might get upset and I feel bad because I made that mistake and so on and so forth. I can go through the questioning process uh, of uh, drilling down into why things are so bad, how they're bad, thinking about how much worse it could be and get to a point where whatever it is that makes me say, God, I'm so stupid, uh, is eventually revealed. And this is good to do with yourself. It's good to have these conversations in your mind. It's not crazy. It's actual. <laughs> it's real. It's when you go inside your mind and have a conversation. Because in my belief, and I'm just, like I said, thinking about this in real time, there is absolutely a connection between our conscious self and our unconscious self. They have to communicate. Because otherwise, we would not be able to take the actions that we take, and especially not be able to have things uh, committed to memory so that when we, for example, get on a bicycle and know how to balance and know what to do, know how to steer, know how to pedal, when all those things take place simultaneously, we're not consciously thinking about doing those things. They just happen. Or if you know how to type or play an instrument, all these things just happen once you are proficient in them because we are, our conscious mind is communicating with our unconscious mind and we are having a conversation with ourselves. So what does all this have to do with anything? Well, <laughs> I believe that once you have a good relationship with yourself, your life just improves. Your relationships outside yourself improve. Everything around you improves 
because now you are communicating with the part of yourself that sometimes you don't want to. And what I mean by that is sometimes we don't want to communicate with the part of ourselves that hurts. We don't want to communicate with the part of ourselves that feels the pain or remembers the bad stuff that happened in our life. We don't want to do that. And, and you know what happens when you don't communicate with that part of you? That part feels neglected. That part feels lonely, rejected. That part feels hurt even more because we are not taking the time to talk to it. I know it sounds weird when I say talk to a part of yourself or communicating with it, (laughs) but it is in us. That part of you is in you that if you are carrying any hurt, pain, or emotional baggage from the past, and if you're not talking to that part of you that is holding on to that pain for whatever reason, then it just stays there and feels alone and feels hurt. So this is a part of you that is so important that wants to be, I don't know, loved, embraced, cared for. It wants to know that somebody is out there caring for us. And sometimes we don't have people in our life that can embrace that in us. So we have to do it. I mean, we should be doing it anyway. That's us. It's a part of you. And going in and communicating with that part of you allows it to know that it's being heard. Sure, you may not be able to heal the pain right away, but just knowing that you're there to listen instead of blocking it off. I mean, imagine that. Imagine you, the you you are today, the conscious you, have this pain and you want to express it to someone and there's no one to express it to. That doesn't feel good. You don't feel safe. And you may feel that way now. So this is when you go inside and talk to yourself. It's, I know it's not the same because we're probably, maybe you're not used to talking with yourself in that way. Or maybe you are and you've had so many conversations you're just <laughs> exhausted. But Maybe you can look at a part of yourself in a different way as if you were in a relationship with that, with that part of yourself, as if that part wanted to be loved as you want to be loved yourself, as if that part wanted to be nurtured and cared for as you want to be nurtured and cared for. This may or may not be a little too mushy for you, but uh, it's healing. It's healing when you start to do this. And you start to identify with and connect with that part of you. And maybe it's a younger part of you. Maybe it's just a part that needs something from you. Maybe it just needs to know you're there. And once you develop and nurture and at least open the line of communication, instead of trying to block it going, oh, if I feel that, it's going to hurt and I never want to think about it. If you open the door a little bit and just say, I'm here. You know, do you want to tell me anything? Do you want to say anything? And be prepared because sometimes (laughs) that part of us says things that we don't expect. We may not like, we may not want to hear, but just allowing, just being an active listener for that part and being the person you are today and allowing that part of you to talk and just express him or herself is a tad bit more freeing than yesterday. So let's go into this next segment with an email I'm going to read that has to do with someone who is dealing with something in themselves and wants to get through it and feel better. Next segment, Ask Paul, coming up. All right, once a week I tell you about GetOutOfTheMess.com and we usually have Asha on to tell us a story or two about how to use the service, how she's used the service and um, we just haven't been able to coordinate schedules lately so I haven't had her on the show. 
I terribly miss her. (laughs) But she will be back and tell us some more crazy stories from the world of all the legal messes that we can all get into. But I want to just quickly mention that uh, Legal Shield, which is basically an on-call legal service. Whenever you need legal advice or have any legal questions at all, you can contact them and they will talk with you for a low monthly payment. The personal plan starts at something like 18 bucks a month and I think the business plan is like 39 a month and it is well worth it. I mean, think about if you have your own business, how many business things require some sort of legal assistance, just contracts and debt collecting and just turning your business into an S corp or an LLC. Some of the things that I have to consider as well, which is why I use this service. It's really a no brainer for me. And I believe it is for you too. So if you want to get connected with this service, contact Asha. She can be reached at 678-355-8777. Or go to getoutofthemess.com and check it out. Just reach out to her and ask her if this service is right for you. It's getoutofthemess.com. All right, this next segment is called Ask Paul. This is where I read a listener email on the air and do my best to answer their questions and Help them through the challenge. This email is from someone I'll call Jack. Here it is. Hi, Paul. I stumbled across your podcast when searching for stress and anxiety on iTunes. I developed anxiety and a perception of life containing too many stressful events, which have culminated into panic attacks, generalized anxiety, strong physical symptoms, and just overall exhaustion. I do a pretty good job of keeping on top of the anxiety, but I can't overcome the final hurdle of ridding it from my life for good. Well, I know you can't expel all anxiety, but ridding the over-proportioned anxiety. It all started when I had panic attacks three years ago, uh, which time I was absolutely convinced that I was dying of a heart attack. Whilst my conscious brain now accepts this as a panic attack, my subconscious still asks the question, but are you sure? which of course keeps my anxiety alive. I've had dozens of similar episodes since then, which reinforce my fear. Your podcast on panic attacks was particularly relevant to me, especially the ultimate fear of death. However, I still struggle with this concept. I wondered whether you've done a podcast on health anxiety and how to approach sensations that one believes are terminal diseases or events And those lingering doubts about, what if the doctor missed something? Or, why do I still get these symptoms when I'm not anxious? Keep up the good work. All right, thank you, Jack. And anxiety is one of the biggest epidemics in, you know, I don't know about the world, but I know in the U.S. a lot of people have anxiety. A lot of people have panic attacks. And it's not something I talk about too often, but I have dedicated an episode or two on it. So definitely, if uh, you're listening right now and you haven't heard it, look for the episode titled, When Panic Attacks, <laughs> the Anxiety Episode. And uh, take a listen to that. See if that uh, gets you through what you need to get through. And also, and I think I just talked about this recently because I recall it quite clearly that I just mentioned Charlie Hone's book, which is Play It Away. Uh, I had him on the show like a year and a half ago, I think. And he talked about how he had pretty much the same symptoms you had. He was working uh, nonstop um, hours and hours and hours and getting anxiety at his job. And he just couldn't get over it. He tried tried everything and he couldn't get over it. So he suddenly discovered that playing helped and then eventually cured his anxiety. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there is a cure for anxiety. That's not my place. Nor do I know every single aspect and facet of anxiety as a whole, like health anxiety or generalized anxiety. But I do know that I've experienced it and up to the point where I've had panic attacks and I've learned how to get beyond it. I've learned my way of getting through it. And my way is 
somewhat unorthodox, but it does work for many, many people. And it may work for you too. However, you listened to that episode on anxiety. (laughs) So maybe it didn't work. Or maybe you didn't understand something that I said. Like you did say, I still can't. What did you say? You said, I still struggle with this concept regarding the ultimate fear of death. And uh, let me just explain what that means. When you are having an anxiety moment or when you are feeling anxiety, it is a fear of something that might happen. It may or may not happen, but we develop a story in our brains and this story becomes a reality that we choose to be afraid of. So this reality that we create in our mind really is just a story, but we believe it will come true. And we're worried that if it comes true, what are we going to do? What's going to happen? What's going to happen to us? We have all these fears that come up if it's true. It's sort of like looking at your bank account, getting lower and lower and closer to zero and wondering, oh my God, if it gets to zero, what am I going to do? What am I going to do if I have no money? (laughs) I mean, I I can't buy food. I can't pay my rent. I, I can't pay my bills or Whatever's going through your mind, it's, you start getting anxious. What am I going to do if this happens? Now, I can speak from experience <laughs> because that's exactly what happened to my wife and I when I was married. Uh, we watched our bank accounts fizzle down to nothing. And then what? <laughs> and yes, um, money has been a huge anxiety for me uh, for a lot of my life. But only when I was close to not having any. When I had it, and when I was working, and I had a full-time position, it was okay. I never felt anxious because I knew the next paycheck was coming. It was a lot easier (laughs) to be comfortable about money when you know a paycheck's coming. But when you lose your job, and you're behind on your rent and your bills, and you can't find other work, and you see your bank account dwindling down to nothing... Thoughts come to mind. Thoughts of what am I going to do? Where am I going to live? How am I going to eat? How am I going to support myself? How am I going to support my family? All these thoughts come up because we concern ourselves with what's next. What's after that? And they're valid concerns. Are they valid enough to be anxious about? That's the hard part is not making them valid enough to be anxious about. And it's almost impossible. (laughs) It really is. I mean, even today, if I looked at my bank account and saw it getting closer and closer to zero, I would probably develop some anxious thoughts. But here's the difference between developing anxious thoughts that are harmful for you and developing anxious thoughts that are helpful for you. When anxiety starts to hit you for any reason, think of it as a signal to do something about it. This is maybe step one. (laughs) Think of anxiety as a signal that I need to address this before it gets worse. And this signal is telling you that you need to do something. You and, and for me, it was hey, my bank account's getting lower and lower, down to zero. I need to do something about it. All right, so what am I going to do? I'm going to find work. I'm going to take action. I'm going to move towards a solution. So anxiety is the signal to for you to move towards a solution. Okay, great. I'll look for work. Weeks later, still no work. I'm still not getting a job. Oh, great. The anxiety's kicking back in. Step one's not working. <laughs> but step one has to be followed. You have to follow and do something towards a solution. But what if your anxiety is about uh, your fear of being around people or fear of being judged from people? Well, that's where step two comes in. Step two is stepping into the fear. I don't really prefer that term, but it's good enough for what I'm talking about today. Stepping into the fear in the sense of whatever you fear 
Make it happen faster than slower. Now, this is where it gets a little unusual. If you fear being judged by someone, then go to that someone and put yourself in the fire. <laughs> Not literally, but put yourself in their judging eyes right away. Get it over with. You've heard that term, eat that frog. It has to do with the first thing you want to do when you get to work is call the hardest client. The first thing you want to do uh, when you wake up is do that thing that you don't want to do most. <laughs> Whether that's exercise or talk to someone you don't want to talk to, call someone you don't want to call, whatever it is, do it first. Getting it out of the way helps resolve the anxiety a lot faster. So step two is do it as fast as possible. Whatever you are afraid of most, do it as fast as possible. Now someone's going to say, I can't do it. I'm too afraid. I don't want to do it. I fear it. So which I would say, Okay, so you prefer to have anxiety over stepping into what you fear. Of course, I prefer not to have anxiety. I would rather get, just get it over with or not have it exist at all. All right, it does exist. It will happen. How about that? Oh my God, no, it will happen. This is step three. Accept that what you think is going to happen will happen. Accept it. It's going to happen. And this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> this is a terrible feeling because now we're not only thinking that it might happen and what are we going to do if it does, but now we're accepting that it will happen and, oh no, what do I do now? Now I really feel a panic coming on. But that's not the only part of this step. This step also includes asking yourself the question, why is it so bad if it does? Okay, uh, my bank account's going to reach zero. Why is that so bad? Why is it so bad? Well, if I have zero money, I can't buy food. Okay, then ask yourself the question again. Why is that so bad? Why is that so bad? That's a stupid question. <laughs> You're allowed to say that. Because if I can't eat, I'll die. And I'm really running to extremes here. Because, you know, there are places that provide food. There are family and friends that provide food. You, you very likely won't die from hunger. But, you know, let's put it on the table. Let's put it as a possibility. Okay, so you die. How is that so bad? Now, <laughs> this is where the brain twists around and says, What? What are you talking about? I want to live. Yeah, but let's just say you die. Why is that so bad? The reason I ask that question, and this is where I'm going with you, Jack, is because this is a place that we never consider going in our mind. And because we never consider the possibility that death is an option, we never consider other options. We never consider other possibilities. We stop ourselves from thinking of the worst thing that could possibly happen so that we don't have to fear it. But there's two reasons I take you there, and one of them is to consider the worst case scenario because when you do, things that lead up to that aren't so bad. If you've been listening a while, you've heard me talk about this, but things leading up to what the worst possible thing that could happen aren't so bad. Suddenly, having no money is a lot better than being dead. <laughs> Sorry to be so blunt, but having no money is a lot better than being dead. In my book. But it's not like we want to. But let's take it to extremes and see how much worse it could get. Having no money is a lot better than being dead. And maybe you don't think that. Maybe you think that having no money is worse than being dead. So what's worse than having no money? What's worse than that? How about going to prison for the rest of your life? That would probably be worse than having no money for a lot of people. It would be for me. I, I wouldn't want to go to prison for the rest of my life. So I think about that. What's that like? Ugh. <laughs> I don't like it. Okay. Is that worse than having no money? Ugh, yes. Talk about how bad it can get. That would be pretty bad for me. I, don't, I couldn't handle it. But I'd rather have no money. And now I think, okay, am I still anxious about having no money? Well, the thought might come to mind of, yeah, but I'm not going to go to prison. 
That's not going to happen. All right, but are you still anxious about having no money? Well, yes, because if I have no money, then I won't be able to take care of my family. And now you start looking at all the aspects of what you're anxious about. Okay, what are the results if your fear came true? If what you fear came true, what are the results? What, what's going to happen beyond that? Because we typically don't visit these results and figure out how bad they're, they're going to be or not bad. We just don't go that far because our brain blocks us from experiencing any more fear because we're already in fear. So we block, even unconsciously, going to these places so that we don't have to deal with them. But the problem is we do have to deal with the anxiety of not thinking about what's worse. So we stay in anxiety. And eventually, uh, a panic state comes in. And what is that panic state? In my non-professional opinion, (laughs) panic arises when you resist feeling anxious. Panic arises when you resist what might happen. And the resistance inside of you causes you to feel worse than you already feel. So you feel anxiety and you go, I don't, I don't want it to happen. I don't want to feel anxious, so you feel more anxious. And I don't want this thing that I fear to happen, so you feel even more anxious. And this compounding effect exponentially multiplies the feelings that you're having, turning into a panic attack. Again, this is my non-professional opinion. I'm not a medical doctor. And everything I say You should not listen to and go to a medical professional immediately if you have any symptoms at all that you think you might need a doctor for. I just look at the mental state and what it leads to. And where we are in our mind leads to how we feel. Where you are with anxiety leads to panic, leads to sweating, leads to heart palpitations, leads to all kinds of stuff that you probably don't want. But why does it come? Because we try to avoid what we fear. And avoiding is resistance. It's, you can feel resistance. You can feel it when you're like, I don't want that to happen. I don't want whatever I fear to come true. So this builds panic and uh, causes us to feel what we feel. Now, the second reason I take you to the worst case scenario is because when you can come to an acceptance of the very worst thing that could possibly happen, then it blows out everything up to that point. It's very similar to what I just said. It's like once you see how bad it can get and you don't want that to happen, everything else doesn't seem so bad. But the second reason is if you can actually accept that the worst thing could possibly happen and put that as an option on the table, suddenly everything that leads up to it is no longer something to fear. It's more of a, I'd rather have those things happen than this other thing happen. Because the chain of events that lead up to what could be a lot worse, it just dissipates. It, it disappears. It no longer has control over you. Because you went down the spiral and figured out what it was like to experience how bad it could possibly get. Is this easy? No. <laughs> um, but it, it is possible. And this is why I take you there, is to get to a point where, hey, you know what? I could end up in prison and get beat up or killed. Boy, that would be pretty bad, but let's just say that's an option. All right, let's just say that's an option. You may not accept it as an option, but I tell you what, it's going to feel a lot better when you're in a crowd of people going, wow, I'd rather be in this crowd of people than that prison. It's a comparison game, really. We're comparing what else could be bad to what's happening in the moment. Now, this isn't like all purpose, this works 100% of the time advice. It's just a philosophy where you start to go, well, how much worse can this get? Like, I remember when I was working in IT, I was working in the hospital and I got this phone call and they left a voicemail and it was, I think, one of my managers. And he said, you know, come down and see me when you get a chance. And uh, <laughs> I listened to this and my first thought was, oh my God, what does he want? (laughs) I got anxious and I started feeling this anxiety thinking, oh, what's happening? I don't know why I'm feeling this way. It's just, he's just telling me to come down and see him when I get a chance. And of course I can equate that to being in school, like 
report to the principal's office. And then that feeling comes over me and I go, oh no, I'm in trouble. I mean, it could have been anything. It could have been, hey, we want to give you a raise or hey, we want to give you two weeks off, which I knew it wouldn't be. <laughs> but um, I didn't know what it was going to be about. So uh, I had this anxiety come over me. So I had to take a break and I go, what is this anxiety about? Why am I anxious? I'm a grown man. I shouldn't be anxious about this. So I went into um, a room by myself and I thought about, okay, what, first of all, what could it be? And my first thought was, well, he could have found something I did wrong. And okay, that makes me anxious. Okay, well, if, if he found something that you did wrong, how is that bad? Well, he could be upset with me. Okay, if he's upset with you, how is that bad? Well, maybe he won't like my performance. Maybe it'll go against my evaluation. Maybe he'll even fire me. All right, he fires you. How is that bad? Well, if he fires me, I have no money. Okay, how is that bad? And you know, so on and so forth. You heard me go through the process. But what you're doing is drilling down till you get to uh, the place that your anxiety stems from. Because this is what Jack was talking about in his letter. He's like, I, I'm struggling with the concept uh, of the ultimate fear of death. Because in, in my opinion, a lot of our fears are an ultimate fear of death. I mean, it doesn't seem so in the trivial moments that we have in our life. But if you think about it, or at least if I try it on, I think about if I don't have any money, I don't have a place to live and I might live on the street. And then I ask myself, okay, how is that so bad? If I live on the street, then no one's caring for me and I'm alone and maybe I feel unloved. Okay, how is that bad? Well, if I feel unloved, then I feel like no one will take care of me and I'm starting to say the same answers. And well, how is that bad? Well, if no one takes care of me, I might die. Okay, how is that bad? And then that's where the brain starts to twist and figure out why I fear death in the first place. Why do I fear death? Why do you fear death? What's so bad about it? If you're a very religious person, maybe you fear death for religious reasons. But I think about dying and I go, wow, I don't know. I guess, I guess there's nothing to fear because my belief is that you just wink out <laughs> and you're gone. And you might believe there's reincarnation. You might believe you go to heaven. You might believe you go to hell. And if that's the case, I'm taking you back to step what, number two, where you take action so that doesn't happen. You take action so that the worst case scenario doesn't happen. And you start to do things a different way. Or if that's not your belief, or you believe something else after you die, what is so bad about that if it happens. I'm not promoting or endorsing death here as an option, but I'm saying is that what we ultimately fear is something at a much deeper level. It, maybe it's not death for you. Maybe it's, you know, fear of being in pain or fear of something else that is very, very deep and very, very powerful. But this is usually where anxiety comes from. It's a deeper level set of beliefs that we fear might happen and we're not sure what we're going to do if it does happen. And let me tell you something else that gets rid of anxiety. If, you're, if you still can't get beyond this just using your thoughts alone, like you're in a situation and you get anxious and you're looking on the, around the room and you're thinking, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, what do I do? And well, Paul said <laughs> to go up to that person and purposely choose to be judged. How about that? If you have a fear of getting judged, just get it over with. Okay, that's what I'll do. It's a huge, bold step for me, and I'm scared as hell, but I'm going to do it. And I'm going to walk up to that person, and and this is probably step four of what I teach a lot, is just tell them, look, I'm anxious. I feel like I'm, I feel like people are watching me. Like, they think I'm ugly, or they, they're they laughing at my clothes. You know, you, would, you don't say exactly that thing, but you find someone to talk to, and you just express what's happening in the moment. I'm feeling anxious. And when you do that, it immediately releases some of the anxious energy because what you're holding in is your fear of people seeing you anxious too. <laughs> so if you go up to someone and say, I'm anxious, and then they'll, they can ask, why? What, what's wrong? Well, I'm anxious because of this. And then they'll say, what? That's nothing to be anxious about or not. But no matter what, it still comes out of you. It's that 
pressure release valve. It comes out and it feels better. I'm not saying the anxiety goes away, but it feels better. Oh, good. Now I feel better. Now I can talk about it more freely and I can feel better about it. This is expressing what you feel in the moment. And this is what I've talked about before when I had to introduce myself to a bunch of people and I used to feel nervous uh, just expressing how nervous I felt doing it in front of those people. It released all the stress. It released the anxiety and nervousness around that. And it also spread all over the room because it broke some of the tension in the room from uh, other people that might have felt that way too. So it has an infectious <laughs> effect when you do things for yourself. It allows other people to feel comfortable around you too. Because almost 80% of the time, if you're in a room full of people, there are others who are feeling the exact same way. And it gets sort of comfortable to know that you're not the only one who feels this way. Because it's true. You are not the only one who feels this way. So really, the, the entire idea behind uh, getting over or getting past anxiety, or at least at a level where it's not so uh, debilitating that you need to take medication, uh, for the most part, I'm talking about general anxiety uh, or even panic attacks. In my life, the, the fastest way to get beyond a panic attack is to make whatever I fear happen as soon as possible so that I'm no longer fearing something ahead of me. I'm in it. And once you're in it, there's a whole new set of things that happen. But you're no longer anxious. But now you have to deal with it. And that's a much better place to be believe it or not. It's much better to, to be in the space of having to deal with it in the moment. If, if your car gets a flat tire, oh, the anxiety that kicks in, oh, I'm in the middle of nowhere or I'm 20 miles from home. Oh, now I, I'm not even sure if I have a spare. So then you check and you don't have a spare. Now you're in the middle of it, but now you're thinking, oh, am I going to get home? So you start walking and now you're not thinking about how you're going to get home. You're just walking. <laughs> I know there's more to it. It's more complex. And there are so many other situations that uh, we deal with anxiety that I'm not addressing here. It is complex because we think about a future that may or may not happen, but we try on all the scenarios if it did happen. And if it does happen, well, what, what am I going to do then? And I could get hurt or I might get yelled at or I might get fired. All these scenarios that we just make up and all we have to do is imagine, okay, I can be okay with getting fired. I can be okay with being homeless. I can be okay if this kills me. This is extreme thinking, I know. But imagine if you could walk through the fire like a warrior <laughs> and not feel the effects of all the stuff that we make up in our mind. That's really what it comes down to. As soon as you stop having fear of some of the, the worst stuff in life, then the little stuff doesn't really affect you as much. It happens, you know, things are going to happen in our life that are unexpected, and we might get anxious about it, but use it as a signal to take action. And for Jack, the person who wrote the letter, the ultimate fear of death that you're struggling with, you don't have to welcome it. You don't have to not fear it. It's just a matter of being okay if that is your destiny. <laughs> and I hate to say it that way because it's just so out there. But think about what you feel if you're dead. And this is, like I said, this is very un unorthodox. And I'm not saying that that's the answer. I'm saying that when we're anxious, it's usually because we fear something at a deep, deep level. And it might have to do with death sometimes because we just want to exist and live and thrive and be in that survival state. Think about what it would be like if you didn't fear that. What would that be like? Try that on. What would it be like if I didn't fear death? Well, okay, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good feeling because now I'm taking bigger steps into bolder things and taking more action on things that maybe I used to fear before. And I think one thing you have to do when you are feeling any type of anxiety at all is to keep checking in going, why am I anxious? 
What's causing this anxiety? Okay, what would happen if what I believe to be true comes true? Oh no. Okay, how is that so bad? Oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. Okay, let's just say it's terrible. What's the result of that? What's going to happen the next day? And what's it going to be like a year from now? What's going to happen? What's the, what's, what are the events that are going to unfold from that one thing that I fear coming true? Because if it comes true, what's it going to be like in a year? I mean, when you think about it a year later, it doesn't seem so bad. So I hope this helps, Jack. Uh, I don't know if it's going to help you get over an ultimate fear of death. And, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us have a fear of death. And sometimes that's what drives us. And I choose not to be driven by fear. I choose not to be driven by what if scenarios. I choose to be driven by the actions I take in the moment and the plans I have for my future. It's, it's that toward and away from strategies that we apply in our life. Do I always want to move towards something, doing things for myself that I want, or always move away from things that I don't want? And those things that I don't want, if I fear them, then maybe I need to face them because I'm sick of fearing them. So I'm just going to face them and get this over with. <laughs> I hope this helps. And certainly if you, if you do have health anxiety or generalized anxiety or any condition that you just think you can't handle on your own, see a medical professional. Thank you for listening to this segment. We'll be right back. All right, I want to talk about the TOB Patron Program. This is a program that I created to help you get more TOB, like you can't get enough. (laughs) But what this is about is um, a members-only area that you can get uh, private episodes where I just come on the air and start, start talking about anything that's on my mind or specific topics that um, the group wants to talk about that you will not hear anywhere else. You will not hear on this show. It's just a place that we can get together and I can share more of this program with you. So if you want those private episodes, they're available for $3 a month. That's it. $3 a month. And then there are other membership levels available if you want to go up from there. Like the next level will give you uh, first in line to get your questions answered on the show. So if you have a topic that you've been wanting to hear and you sent me an email and I didn't talk about it yet, you'll be first in line. So that's a little benefit there. And you also receive the worksheets as they're released. And uh, if you go up another level, you get a private email address for me that no one else has. (laughs) And this will give you a priority turnaround too. So if you wrote to me a couple months ago and you wanted a faster response, this is how you can do it. And then finally, at the uh, highest level, we also have live group coaching and personal hangouts and just a place where we can congregate and talk and you can ask your questions or we can just have some fun. And I'm going to have some guest coaches on as well and we'll talk about all kinds of things. If you're interested in this, go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash member. And if you remember, (laughs) last week I sent you there and the link was dead and I felt pretty bad about it. And I came up with a mini episode that talked about it. And I hope you heard that episode because I do apologize for that. The link and the site and the page is up and running now. So definitely check it out. Go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash member. It's only $3 a month to get the extra content. And um, not only will you be getting those benefits and more, but uh, you'll be helping the show out too. So this is a way to keep us going and keep giving you more and more of this, hopefully getting better all the time, or or at least hitting on the topics that you want to hear about, helping you achieve a new level of personal evolution. So come on over and join me over there. I hope to see you. We'll talk to you soon. All right, we have time for one more 
Ask Paul email. Like I said, I get a lot of emails and I want to fit as many into a show that I can. And this one is a, a lengthy email, so I'm going to just really, really condense it. And um, I have a pretty quick answer for it. And, but I just want to read it to you because it's very important. Uh, some people that you know or maybe yourself do this, <laughs> what this person does. I'm going to call her uh, Jenny. And Jenny writes, you know, I listen to your show all the time. And like I said, I'm going to condense this really quick. Uh, I came into a relationship a few years ago and uh, he moved in and my kids grew to love him. And then he moved out and then he was with someone else and then he moved back in and then he was with someone else when he moved out again. And the email goes back and forth quite a bit of him moving in and moving out. And every time he moves out, he finds someone else and then he begs for forgiveness to come back. And then he says something that he holds against her uh, every time he comes back. Like, you said things that hurt me. So that's why I keep leaving. I keep thinking about those things that you said that hurt me. And so she's taken aback like four, five, six times. And it just keeps coming back at her. And she's finally sick of it. And I'm thinking, this is good. Finally sick of it. Good. So... Her question then goes into, where do I go from here? How can he move on so fast from me? Why does he keep coming back and hurting me? I take responsibility for allowing it to happen, but as a person, how can you keep doing this to someone over and over and over? I don't want him back once he's done doing his dirt. (laughs) I'm tired. I'd love your opinion about this, and maybe I'm not seeing something I ought to be seeing. I haven't changed appearance-wise, and I would like to think that I am wiser than I was three years ago. His parents were drug addicts. Dad overdosed and died when he was a child. And mom got clean uh, a number of years ago. And he's the baby of the family. I came from a house with both my parents who had me when they were in their teens. And they were very abusive, uh, domestic violence in my house as a child. And emotionally and physically abused by my mother. I am the oldest child. Please help me. So Jenny, I've talked about the abused mind before. The abused mind is the mind that continues to raise the level of toleration, to raise the bar on how bad the abuse can get over and over and over again. There's something in how your brain is wired to continue accepting punishment uh, over and over again and increasing that punishment over and over again. And what you're doing And you said you take responsibility for allowing this stuff to happen. And yes, that's a great start. Take responsibility. The next step is to step out of the situation and see it as it really is. I'm going to give it to you straight. He knows exactly how to manipulate you and get what he wants. And he is very selfish and He knows exactly what to say to you and what to do so that you'll take him back every time. He knows it. And when he notices that what he's doing doesn't work as well, he comes up with something else. And he's gotten very good in his life at manipulating circumstances for his selfish gain. So whatever he wants, he's learned how to get by decoding your behavior and your responses. And he does this very easily because all he has to do is test boundaries. You know how a child will push the boundaries of their parents? And I I just said this in a coaching session the other day. They'll write on the walls and one of the parents will come in and go, what are you doing writing on the walls? And the kid feels sorry. Oh, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. And so then they write on the floor the next day and he's like, what are you doing writing on the floors? (laughs) You said not to write on the walls. (laughs) So the kid is like, he's not maybe doing it on purpose, but sometimes they do. They figure out at what point the parent gets angry. They figure out at what point the adult or caretaker in their life will reach their snapping point. And uh, kids do this constantly, minute by minute, trying to figure out, what is allowed and what's not. And they develop quite a a criteria in their head of what they can do and what they can't do. 
So what they do then is then do as much as they possibly can right up to that breaking point. Right up to that point where you can't stand it. They will rub that wound raw <laughs> until you break. And unfortunately, some adults are like this too. They never grow up and they probably don't care. He has learned where your boundaries are and he keeps pushing the limits purposefully knowing that he'll eventually get what he wants. Maybe you are a giving person. So he'll just exploit that givingness in you, that generosity in you. And he'll find ways to use that against you. Because if you're giving and you're kind and you're compassionate, then he'll act wounded because you'll want to help him. And this happens over and over again in many relationships where one person will feel sorry for the other person and the other person can keep getting away with stuff over and over again because you're a compassionate, kind person. Where the failure starts, however, is asking what is right for you. And ask yourself this, do you want someone who commits to a relationship and sticks with you through the thick and thin, no matter what you've said to him, no matter what mean things you've said? Because if, if you want someone who can stick with you through the thick and thin, then he's not the one. He's not. Because what he's doing is using your words against you, even though you've probably apologized about what you said. So if he really is affected and he keeps coming back, then all he's doing is exploiting you and using you. Like I said, I'm being straightforward here. This is a problem. This is a dysfunction that you keep enabling in him. And the sad part is, is that he's very good at sounding and looking authentic. He's very good as acting as that wounded child that he feels like you beat him and then you feel guilty because he convinced you that you beat him, even though it's not a physical thing. This is extremely unhealthy to continue. So any love that you have are probably characteristics that you enjoy about him, but he does not represent the person that you deserve in your life. Now, this leads to my second point, which is, what do you think you deserve in life? Do you think you deserve someone who just keeps you around just in case the rest of their life falls apart? I mean, think about that. You're always a backup plan. You're not a backup plan, but you are allowing yourself to be treated as a backup plan. But for what purpose? What is it that he gives you that you've not given a chance for any other man or woman, (laughs) I don't know your preference, to give you? What is it that this person gives you that no one else has had a chance to do that for you? Because whatever you're stuck on with this person, you need to reverse your thinking and concentrate on all the damage he's doing to both you and your children. Now, I don't say that to put you down because I really do believe that you have a giant heart and you're very generous and kind and forgiving and that can be a big problem. We think that we should all have this giant heart and be super forgiving and everyone in our life can make all these mistakes and we'll just take them back. And I have to warn you against that. And I also have to warn you about how you are being compassionate towards other people and not yourself. Because if you were your own best friend, you would look at yourself first and go, okay, are my needs getting met here? Am I doing what's right for me first? This is where compassion starts. This is where you need to start in your relationship with yourself. I need to be compassionate with myself first. What does that mean? That means you do not let volatile people into your life. And I don't mean physically abusive. I mean he is emotionally abusing you. He is. I hate to say it, you are being abused by this person and you are allowing it to happen repeatedly. Not anymore because you said you're sick of it and I hope you're right. 
I'm never usually this straightforward with anyone, but this email concerns me to the point where I need to tell you it's time to let him go because you are worth more than that. You are definitely worthy of being treated with respect because there is someone out there who would love your generosity and reciprocate in kind and treat you like the queen that you are. And the only way to attract that type of person is to start healing yourself. How do you heal yourself? You start honoring yourself. You start being compassionate toward yourself. Stop exposing yourself to toxic people. Those aren't the kind of people you want in your life. And those are the kind of people that will keep you from progressing in life, that will keep you from being healthy in your relationships. Healthier relationships are easier to attract when you are healthy inside. And only a healthy person is going to let other healthy people in. If you are not so healthy, if you are more dysfunctional than not, because we all have some level of dysfunction, if you're more dysfunctional than not, then you're going to attract the people in your life that are at the same, if not worse, level of dysfunction than you are. And everything's going to seem great for the first few months until the dysfunctional needs are met and now you want to settle into life a little bit more with the person and you realize there's not much more than complimenting each other's dysfunction. So what I want you to do is be single for a while and figure out what you need in a relationship versus what you want in a relationship and also write a list of the things that you absolutely will not stand for in your next relationship. In fact, that's a good practice. Write what you absolutely want and write what you absolutely don't want in your next relationship. Then, when your next relationship happens, you can evaluate what's going on in that relationship with the list. And don't settle for less. That's my final piece of advice. Don't settle for less. Because in my life, I would rather be single than not have 95% of my list fulfilled. For example, if my girlfriend wanted to start smoking, I'd be like, I would rather be single than have you smoke. And if she's like, well, that's tough. I want to smoke. Then I'd be like, okay, then I need to honor myself and get out of this because I won't settle. I will not do it. Now, (laughs) that sounds a little cold and uncompromising, but I've learned to honor myself to the point where I want to stay in integrity with myself. I want to have a good relationship with myself. It's like the beginning of this episode, relating to yourself. It's keeping that relationship with yourself so that you're always in good terms with yourself. It sounds a little strange when I say that, but the point is to to be congruent with what you want and what you deserve for yourself. And how do we get what we don't deserve? We think we're less worthy than we are. And I'm here to tell you that you are more worthy than you think you are and that you deserve absolutely more than what he is capable of giving you. He is incapable of doing that for you. So let him go. Let him go. Let him learn his own lessons so that he can heal and grow if that's his path so that you can start your healing process too. Because once you cut that energetic tether and you're disconnected from him, you can start the healing process and get to a better point in yourself. So I hope this helps you understand where I'm at with this and where I want you to be. It is so vital for your health and happiness to not be around toxic people like this and not let people exploit your kindness. You're a kind person and you're also overly compassionate to other people without giving yourself enough compassion for yourself. And when you do that, when you're more compassionate to others than yourself, then from where are you really giving? You're not really giving from a compassionate place. And after you show kindness and compassion, you're also left with a deficit of less for yourself. And that's a dangerous place to be. So I really hope this helps, Jenny. Thank you so much for writing. I want you to have a much better life than you've been having because you deserve it and your kids deserve it 
And there's a lot to learn from this relationship and what you can bring forward into your life as experience and especially wisdom. Thank you again for writing. And thanks for listening to the show. I appreciate you tuning in and I look forward to connecting with you once again next time. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank Asha with GetOutOfTheMess.com. You can move forward alone and hope things go well. Or you can pay less than a dollar a day to get a team of attorneys to get you through almost any situation. That's your on-call legal service. If you're in the U.S. or Canada, visit GetOutOfTheMess.com or call 678-355-8777 and talk with Asha today. I want to thank those who are using the Amazon link or who purchased one of my books or worksheets. If you're into deeper learning, those books or worksheets are a really good way to go. And if you're using the Amazon link, wow, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. That is helping and your contributions and shopping habits are making a difference. Thank you again. I want to quickly remind you of the TOB patron program. It's only $3 a month and you get more, more of this, more episodes. And not not like these episodes that you hear now with all the music transitions. Some of it's just me getting on the air, talking, and giving you a piece of advice or talking about um, a message that I couldn't read on the air and other stuff that uh, will be members-only episodes. So I really hope to see you in the member program. Just go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash member. I also want to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. And to close the show, I want to mention the letter that Jenny wrote, which is uh, the second email that I read today. Uh, One of the things she said was, how can people do stuff like this? How can someone act like this? I'm talking about her ex that Uh, continued to leave her over and over again and see other people and then come crawling back to her and she took him back almost every time or every time I'm not sure and I think the last time she didn't take him back or maybe there wasn't a last time but there will be and she's trying to avoid this cycle and you know her question how can people be like that well I hate to say this but a lot of us allow it to happen How can people be that way is because we allow it to happen. Let me repeat that. (laughs) We allow people to be that way. Now, before you beat me up, this is why I say this. Without supply, there is no demand. Or there is a harder to fulfill demand. What you supply to someone is what they will demand of you. And when you are out of what you supply they will no longer demand. Well, they can try to demand, but they won't get it because you are out. (laughs) What does that mean? Let's put it this way. At one time, I was on unemployment benefits and I was also on welfare. And I tell you what, having money come in where I could buy food and I could get my rent paid and other things, without having to work was very enticing and I did it for about six months and it felt pretty good (laughs) it felt pretty good Uh, I'm just being honest being handed money and so that I could go shopping and uh, I have all this free time during the day and and I thought to myself at the time wow I can see why people stay on this program (laughs) it's It's easier than working. (laughs) Now, these are my words. That doesn't mean it was easy for them, but for me, it was easier than working. And I had to snap out of it. I was really entranced knowing how easy it was just to get money and continue on a funded program that was already in place. And I didn't have to do anything special. I mean, there's a couple of things that I had to keep the supply coming, but I didn't have to do anything special. Just kept happening. It didn't take long for me to come to this snapping point where I said, wait, 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 wait. 
I can't stay on this program. This isn't right. I, I need to get off this program and make more money because it's not, it's not survivable. It's not like I can keep saving money at all. But it was very enticing. So that program was there. And it felt good knowing it was there. And I needed it at the time. But boy, getting used to it uh, was hard to break because I was so used to the money coming in all the time where I didn't even have to go to a 9 to 5 job. That's so enticing. And this is what happens in relationships. Now, I yes, I did get out of that. I did finally get work. But I was part of that system. It, and it was a hard psychology to to break out of. It was a hard pattern to get out of. Because it was so easy. <laughs> it was just easy to be in that system. And when I finally got out of it and got back into the workforce and got back on my feet, uh, I felt better. It was like, okay, now I'm accomplishing something. But boy, that was enticing. And I had to think about it. And where was I at in my head? And this is what happens in relationships. Where one person continues to supply or enable the other person being who they are. When you enable someone, someone's behavior, so they they continue that behavior without the consequences, without accountability, they'll continue because it's easy. (laughs) They probably, for the most part, won't feel too bad for you because they're getting their needs met and it's easy. This is a typical uh, codependent relationship with a lot of people One's an enabler and one's a taker. This is great for the taker. And it it sucks the energy out of the enabler. Yet they don't realize they're doing it to themselves. When you enable someone, when you allow behavior to continue without consequence, without accountability, you are doing it to yourself. You are fully 100% responsible when it happens. Yes, they're responsible for doing it too, but don't expect them to change because they won't. And even if they do, fantastic for them. Let them go heal and grow on their own and maybe they'll come back one day as a changed person. But don't expect to see that change from them uh, ever (laughs) because you need to get to a place where you don't allow that in your life anymore. Jenny needs to get to a place where she looks at her life and goes, I don't want that in my life. And she has to be serious about it. You have to be serious and you have to commit. Even if it means you lose something that you might want. Jenny might like a lot of the qualities and characteristics of this person. Yet he is toxic as hell. (laughs) I hate to be so bold here, but he is. He's toxic because he's taking advantage of her over and over again. Now, I don't know the whole story, but from the letter, this is what I interpret and this is how I see what's happening. And I've seen this over and over again. And typically, I hate to say men will do this more than women. Men will find a woman's vulnerabilities and exploit them. So if you're that type of person that takes advantage of someone else, then I'm sending a message to that someone else right now. (laughs) If you're listening and you're so overly compassionate and you're so kind and you're so forgiving, it's time to be more aware that you're being taken advantage of when this kind of thing is happening, especially if it's repeated. And especially if you keep blaming the other person yet you keep them in your life. That's a huge warning sign. You blame them for what they're doing, but you keep them in your life. Huge, huge red flag on you (laughs) to say, wait, what am I doing to continue to allow this to continue happening? I'm telling you what you're doing. You're allowing it to happen. You are bringing them back in because they're taking advantage of your kindness. So it's time to start being kind to the right person in your life. Start being compassionate to the right person in your life. You. Start being compassionate and honoring you first. Because someone who honors themselves doesn't settle for people who are toxic to them. I just want this to be clear with you that if someone in your life 
makes you feel bad more often than good, then they are probably toxic. If there's a cycle or pattern of behavior that someone keeps repeating in your life, and they are still in your life because you're allowing it, that is you that needs to change the situation, not them. Because it's easy for them. Because they know how to exploit you and exploit your vulnerabilities and take advantage of you. Don't make it easy for them anymore. Come up with consequences. Come up with accountability so that no one can take advantage of you. Because you're more worthy than that. Even if you don't feel you are. I know you are. (laughs) I know you are. And I don't want you around toxic people. So whatever you have to do, first things first, honor yourself. And if you are with toxic people that you just can't seem to get away from, then start planning a way to get away from them. Just start planning it. Toxic people bring you down. They will wear you down. They will make you ill. And you will feel the effects of it. Uh, Day after day, week after week, year after year, it will get worse and worse. It never gets better. Hopefully you're not with toxic people. Hopefully you're secure in yourself and you know what you want for yourself and you're only allowing people in your life that lift you, make you feel more positive about yourself and just want you to be happy. Best kind of person to have in your life. I want you to be happy. And with that, open your mind and step into your power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, which is why I just said everything I did. (laughs) You are amazing. Amazing.